ASEAN is a political and economic community of 10 Southeast Asian countries with strong growth potential, including Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, and Singapore. The South Korea ASEAN Commemorative Summit will be held in Busan from November 25th to the 26th to celebrate 30 years of friendly ties between South Korea and ASEAN. 미래 동반 성장의 파트너이 아세안과 메콩과의 협력을 획기적으로 발전시키고 연계성을 더욱 강화하며 공동 번영을 위한 협력을 논의하는 뜻깊은 자리가 될 것입니다. President Moon Jae-in unveiled his new southern policy, which seeks to expand Seoul's diplomatic horizon and improve its economic ties with Southeast Asian countries. ASEAN is South Korea's key partner in this initiative that also has a potential to help bring peace and prosperity to the Korean Peninsula. The South Korea ASEAN Commemorative Summit will be the third of its kind to be held in South Korea, following the first meeting in Jeju in 2009 and the second one in Busan in 2014. ASEAN summits are rarely held outside the ASEAN region. South Korea is the only ASEAN dialogue partner where special ASEAN summits will have taken place three times. The upcoming South Korea ASEAN Commemorative Summit will be a venue to look back on 30 years of cooperation between South Korea and ASEAN and present a new vision for the next 30 years. On today's special episode of Peace and Prosperity, on the South Korea ASEAN Commemorative Summit, our host, Hong Young Shi, research fellow at Yonsei University's Institute for North Korean Studies, and Marty Natalegawa, former foreign minister of Indonesia, to discuss ASEAN's role in international diplomacy and security, as well as in peace and prosperity of the Korean Peninsula. Hello and welcome to our program. This year marks the 30th anniversary of formal relations established between South Korea and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN. Where do relations stand today and what role is ASEAN playing in ensuring the peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula? We are going to discuss these issues with a special guest, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, Dr. Mati uh, Natagawa. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Uh, this is not uh, our first time uh, seeing uh, each other uh, to have this kind of conversation yes. on important issues. Yes. But uh, you look great. And thank you very much indeed. As in the past. Right. right. Um, first of all, uh, we are uh, looking forward to uh, the third ASEAN uh, ROC commemorative summit meeting in Busan mm -hmm. uh, toward the end of this month. Uh, tell us about uh, uh, your thoughts on the significance of this uh, summit meeting. Well, uh, ASEAN and Korea, we are strategic partners. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the official uh, designation. Uh, what does strategic partners mean? It means the relationship between the 10 member states of ASEAN collectively and Korea has resonance, has importance far beyond the two sides' bilateral relationship. It has impact on the wider region, on Southeast Asia, on Northeast mm -hmm. Asia. So I can't emphasize enough how important and strategic is this relationship in helping secure the peace, stability, and prosperity of our, our two regions. Mm -hmm. uh, but not only in that way, uh, the fact that the summit is being convened here in Korea is of tremendous uh, symbolic and substantive importance. Mm -hmm. I hope through the summit, by hosting the summit, the Korean people can better understand uh, the promise offered by ASEAN, the potentials in our two sides relationship. In other words, for Korea to take ownership mm -hmm. uh, of the process as well. So it's mm -hmm. not only events and, and that we normally organize in ASEAN capitals, mm -hmm. but this ASEAN belongs to Koreans mm -hmm. as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's just stay on the same topic mm. and broaden it, mm. uh, because you actually authored the book, Does ASEAN Matter, yes. which is uh, ranking really high on Amazon.com, I Thank believe, you. right? <laughs> yes. And it's going to be really popular in South Korea, too. Thank you. Uh, tell us more about the main points you address in the book, including the dynamic equilibrium mm. or whether uh, Indonesia, South Korea, those middle powers, mm. 
in cooperation with the regional organization like ASEAN mm. can make important differences mm. in world affairs? Well, I, I purposefully, uh, the book title is in the form of a question. Mm -hmm. Does ASEAN matter? Does ASEAN uh, matter? Yes. Um, you know, I didn't want to sort of make a statement mm. simply celebrating what I believe to be a given fact. But I want to be as, as uh, analytical and as inquisitive and mm. honest as possible. Uh, because I have been part of the system over the past 30 years and I want to be as honest as possible. And upon reflections, I do recall at least three types of uh, uh, contributions that ASEAN has made over the past five decades, mm -hmm. uh, all of them transformative. And at the risk of oversimplification, one is definitely in transforming the relationship between Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to ASEAN, uh, you know, Southeast Asia was a region marked by tensions, marked by animosity, mm -hmm. and 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 even vi open conflict. And uh, we had what was then a trust deficit among yeah, countries yeah. of Southeast Asia and now had become a strategic trust. And this was largely due to ASEAN. ASEAN provided a home for differences to be managed. But besides the intra-ASEAN uh, dynamics, ASEAN also managed to transform the place of Southeast Asian countries in the wider region. Because prior to ASEAN, Southeast Asian countries were largely like objects or pawns in major power rivalries. Right, right. We didn't have a say in how uh, on subjects that affects us all. But having ASEAN come together, we've been able to earn centrality. Mm -hmm. So we become like the, the, uh, the hub for various regional cooperation and not least of all transformative in the economic sense, uh, you know, because the economies of ASEAN today is some of the most vibrant and the most resilient in our, in our region, uh, thanks to the peace and stability that we've been able to foster. But the book doesn't stop there. It, it, it's not meant to be a celebration. It's meant to, be, uh, uh, to provide like a roadmap ahead. But my main Same. message is that while we have had uh, such successes in the past, complacency uh, cannot be uh, allowed to occur. We have to think anew what are the new challenges? Because the world of 2019, 2020 is nothing like 1967. Definitely. Uh, things yeah. change, the environment is different. How can ASEAN remain relevant? It has to reinvent itself, uh, reconstitute itself even, and reach out to our partners such as uh, Korea. But this book is not only uh, in an analysis of the role of ASEAN, but hopefully as well, uh, where it matters on its interaction with Korea as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Okay, that's going to be uh, my next question to you, uh, Minister, because Indonesia was a special place mm -hmm. uh, to South Korea, and especially uh, this Moon Jae-in government of South Korea, mm -hmm. because um, you know, new southern policy, one of the signature mm -hmm. foreign policies of the Moon Jae-in government of South Korea, uh, has started mm. in 2017 mm. when President Moon Jae-in made a, um, in an announcement mm. in uh, Jakarta, Indonesia. Mm. And um, now uh, President Moon Jae-in has fulfilled his promise to uh, visit all 10 ASEAN member countries. Mm. So ASEAN uh, means a lot to South Korea. Mm -hmm. Conversely, South Koreans also want that South Korea means a lot to Indonesia mm -hmm. and other ASEAN member countries. Mm. Do you see reasons that South Korea is important well, and endearing to ASEAN and Indonesia? Well, first of all, on the new Southern policy, um, uh, leadership matters. Leadership matters. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, how leaders present the opportunities and the challenges ahead matters in setting the tone. And I must express admiration how, of how successive uh, Korean governments and of course, uh, the current government has continued to invest in its relationship with Southeast Asia. Mm. And I think it, there's a tremendous assets for ASEAN to be able to develop. But Korea, you know, if you look at the numbers, uh, the numbers speak for themselves. And I'm not an economist, obviously, mm. but there are numbers, trade, investment, tourism flow that simply reinforce the message mm. that Korea and, in, and ASEAN, Indonesia including within it, Vietnam and others, relationship, economic ties are becoming ever more mm -hmm. uh, stronger, even more enhanced. And with the ASEAN economy is going to become even more 
thriving in the next in 2040, 2050 that projects ASEAN collectively as being the fourth or the fifth biggest economy in the right, world. Right. It's, on, it's all only about opportunities rather than uh, problems. But beyond numbers, it's to do with the, uh, the, the sentiment. As I was saying in various occasions, South Korea, Korea and Southeast Asia, you are like a superpower in terms of the goodwill mm. uh, and the positive sentiments people in Southeast Asia feel towards Korea. Mm. There is no historical, there is no ideological, there is no cultural hindrances. Mm. Uh, we are in awe and in inspired by what you have, you have trans how you have Korea have transformed itself over the many decades. And your, I speak on, on, on Indonesia, for instance. When in 1998, mm. Indonesia went through very difficult financial crisis right, right. at a time when many businesses, foreign businesses were leaving Indonesia in droves. Korean businesses, Korean expatriates are the few that remain. Mm. And we never forget that. Mm. You know, when others were leaving Jakarta, leaving Indonesia, Korean expatriate, Korean community in Indonesia, they stay put. Mm -hmm. They invest more. They say, well, this is time for opportunity. I think mm -hmm. that kind of uh, loyalty and, and, and solidarity matters mm -hmm. uh, for us. And, and so I think it, now it's the business of getting things done. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the sentiment is there, the will is there, but we need to effectuate. We need to act, put, put things into action. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Definitely. Mm -hmm. okay. The Moon Jae-in administration has been eyeing ASEAN as a key partner in Seoul's peace drive. He looks to work together with the regional bloc to address the North Korea issue by tapping into its close ties with the regime. Here's a short clip highlighting the decade-old relationship between ASEAN and North Korea. The night before his historic summit with U.S. President Donald Trump in June 2018, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un went on a surprise tour of downtown Singapore. He visited the city-state's choice attractions, including the Marina Bay Sands, for over two hours. Kim's tour triggered speculations that he might be considering Singapore as an economic model for North Korea. Immediately after the second Kim Trump summit ended abruptly without a deal in Vietnam in February, Kim took a tour of the presidential palace of Vietnam to kick off his official friendship visit to the country. North Korea's interest in ASEAN is not new. After the two Koreas formed their own governments in 1948, the North established diplomatic ties with the Soviet Union the predecessor state of Russia in the same year and with China in the following year. Since the 1960s, North Korea has sought to strengthen relations with ASEAN to reduce its economic dependence on China and Russia. It has established diplomatic relations with all 10 ASEAN nations starting with Vietnam in 1950, followed by Indonesia and Cambodia in 1964, and lastly with the Philippines in 2000. North Korea has developed trade relations with the ASEAN bloc, with the North exporting iron ore and zinc to Malaysia and importing rubber and palm oil from that country. North Korea joined the ASEAN Regional Forum, or ARF, in 2000 with support from Thailand. Today, the ARF remains as the only regional security dialogue that includes North Korea. In 2010, the North signed ASEAN Treaty of Amity and Cooperation in Southeast Asia, or TAC opening doors to increase cooperation with ASEAN countries. Key principles of the TAC include non-interference in the internal affairs of one another, settlement of disputes by peaceful means, and renunciation of use of force. Expectations are high that ASEAN could play a role in bringing peace and prosperity to the Korean Peninsula by tapping into its strong economic and diplomatic ties with the North. Well, Minister, Minister, as you have watched, uh, there is a long history of a close tie between ASEAN as a regional forum and ASEAN member countries and North Korea. Mm -hmm. 
And that might be a good asset for mm -hmm. South Korea, but at the same time, something that South Korea may feel uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, what accounts for that uh, close tie between mm -hmm. ASEAN and North Korea? Well, ASEAN as an organization is always, has always had uh, an inclusive outlook. Inclusive um, outlook. Inclusive outlook. Uh, we reach out to uh, countries of different, uh, uh, different inclinations. Mm -hmm. Uh, precisely for the, the reason being that we, are not, we do not pretend to be a like-minded uh, group of countries. Uh, diversity is our strength. Mm -hmm. uh, in our view, it is best to have a, tent, a common tent under which different countries of different persuasion can mm -hmm. have dialogue, can have uh, uh, communications, uh, negotiations even between themselves, rather than have them out of the tent and becomes a source of uh, problems. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, your, um, as your footage shows, um, North Korea has been a member of the ASEAN Regional Forum for right, quite a right. few years now. And it is the only forum uh, in our region where they are present mm -hmm. and, and in, in this uh, format. But uh, I think we can do better uh, in terms of really utilizing uh, that forum to be able to foster communications. Uh, thus far, it has been informal in nature. A lot of the formal uh, discussions are very, uh, very strict to, to well-known positions. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, the Republic of Korea would present its own official positions, DPRK likewise, and it's everything very rigid. But at the same time, there have been moments in the past, and I, as I explained in the book, when, when everything else was in a shutdown mode, when there was no communication between the North and the South, US and the North, uh, ASEAN Regional Forum became the only game in town. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we made possible some changes that, of dynamics through informal fleeting exchanges, mm -hmm. which I think is very precious uh, if the risk of uh, miscommunication is, is very prevalent. So uh, the, clo the ties that we have, countries of ASEAN have with DPRK, is not at the expense of any other countries, and, and not least, of course, uh, the uh, Republic of Korea. Yeah. Right. Uh, don't you think it's very interesting phenomenon that uh, the denuclearization of North mm. Korea uh, made a huge progress with the two summit meetings between U.S. President and the uh, uh, Supreme Leader of North Korea? Mm. But the sites of two U.S. DPRK summit meetings happen to be in ASEAN region, Capitals, like Singapore yeah. yes. and uh, Vietnam. Yes. So, um, tapping on your previous remark, mm. what kind of contributions do you think ASEAN can exercise mm. uh, to move uh, the uh, agenda of denuclearization? Yes. Of the well, companies? I think ASEAN must proceed, must go beyond uh, its convening power. Uh, clearly, there is a comfort level mm -hmm. that countries outside of ASEAN have of ASEAN countries so they, that we are able to host such important uh, events, mm -hmm. uh, the, the summits that we refer to, as well as the ASEAN summits. But uh, how can we be more influential beyond simply be a good convener, uh, convening power? And this is to do with the substance. Mm -hmm. And I think on, on the Korean Peninsula dynamics, uh, it is now at a very critical juncture uh, between positive and negative possibilities. And I think there is no shortage of advice and shortage of uh, goodwill from many sides to try to contribute. For me, the most important thing, whatever process gets underway in on the Korean Peninsula, it has to be region driven. It has to be region driven, driven. Uh, by the countries of the region, namely mm -hmm the ROK, the two Koreas, and countries of Northeast Asia. Mm -hmm. And ASEAN must be out there supporting, facilitating even uh, this process. Because otherwise, changing dynamics is a very fraught and a very, you need a lot of resilience and patience because there will be ups and downs. Right, right. And I feel that ASEAN must be a little bit more forthcoming in encouraging uh, through, you know, whenever there are failures and, and, and difficulties, that all sides to, you know, to keep at it, mm -hmm. to go on with the diplomatic path.
But uh, ASEAN is also uh, premised upon the principle of non-intervention, right? Yes, so, yes. but at the same time, ASEAN member countries are really uh, supportive for the principle of nuclear non-proliferation. Mm. So I think it would pose a dilemma to yeah. ASEAN as a yes. whole to make the right balance Absolutely. between yeah. the two. I mean, you, you, you're exact, quite right. I mean, uh, we have today, I think, whether it be ASEAN or any other organization, we have a, a, a critical need to be able to synergize between national level developments, national level dynamics, whether it be in the domain of security, in the economic, commercial domain, on human rights, national level and the regional and global. How can we make them go hand in hand mm -hmm. as if they are not either or? Non-interference, yes, uh, is an ASEAN principle, is a principle applying globally. But it doesn't mean that we are passive to developments. It doesn't mean that we, are, we become non-committal and, and lack, showing lack of concern about development as well. Mm -hmm. We live in the 21st century, not mm -hmm. in the 20th or 19th century. Already. We, yeah. we should be able to dis demonstrate our compassion mm -hmm. uh, that transcends boundaries. Mm -hmm. But on, on, the, um, on the nuclear proliferation per se, uh, a lot is at stake because if the nuclear genie is uh, allowed, allowed to, to be out of the bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it can have a huge, tremendous uh, proliferation impact, cascading throughout the right, region. Right. Because if one more country becomes, uh, obviously, uh, there is an action, potential for action, reaction, uh, more armaments, and yet less security. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to be smarter. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to earn security at a less, lesser cost rather than having more armaments that's prone to a miscalculation and conflict as well. So in that regard, uh, ASEAN as a whole remains supportive for the ongoing uh, dialogue and negotiation Absolutely. between Washington and yes. Pyongyang? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, wh what's the alternative? Can, can but we, some I mean, people criticize yeah. it's just empty talks. Well, I mean, I would rather have people having lengthy talks with no image. The process is often as important as the as the okay. out outcome. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds, but then the old, when I saw, you know, sitting back home and I saw televisions coming, for, you know, as reported by Arirang, mm -hmm. uh, developments, you know, the Panjumant, uh, the summits, mm -hmm. those are images that you would never imagine in my lifetime that I would ever see. Oh, it was, it is, it was huge potential here. Surely, the di I'm not a, uh, currently in, in office, but uh, as a diplomat, but if I was a diplomat now, I would be really at it. This is it. This is this is a game-changing life in a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make a positive difference. I see. What, what, what a precious time this right. is. Now. Three three leaders together. Absolutely. Trump, I Kim mean, Jong Un, that's, Moon Jae in. Yeah, that, that, that's that's uh, is. I, I mean, is is. I was speechless when I saw that. So, oh, imagine this. I and mean, imagine what kind of message it's sending to the peoples of the countries concerned. Mm -hmm. This we need, not just leaders. We need leadership. Mm. I think this is often the problem nowadays. We can have a leadership deficit. You know, countries <laughs> okay. disagree in a very bad way. Yeah. Okay, all yeah. right. Thanks. <laughs> now we'll hear observations from the, the U.S. on the current state of nuclear dialogue. Joining us on the line is Michael O'Hanlon, senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Hello. It's very nice to be with you today, and thanks for having me on the show. You're very welcome. North Korea test fired ballistic missiles on October 31st and it still remains on the U.S. sponsors of terrorism list. Against this backdrop, is the window of dialogue between the two slowly closing? Yes, I think the window of dialogue is closing. It doesn't mean that it's lost forever and perhaps we could find a way to reopen it. But at the moment, it seems close to shut. North Korea, of course, is refusing to negotiate. <clears throat> Essentially, I believe Kim Jong-un just wants to talk to President Trump and believes that's the best and most promising form of diplomacy because he seems to have a good rapport with Trump and then uh, Trump leaves whatever summit they've had. And then the next things that uh, the United States says are much more hard line, much tougher, more traditional American positions. And that means Kim Jong-un winds up feeling a little confused and uh, feeling a little bit perhaps even uh, betrayed by President Trump. Now, I'm not trying to defend Kim Jong-un, 
but I think that he has found this surprising personal chemistry with, with President Trump, and he wants to take advantage of that. But everything else in the process is preventing that or slowing it down. So you see the North Koreans increasingly insulting almost everyone in the U.S. government except Donald Trump. You see the North Koreans still abstaining from nuclear tests or long-range missile tests, but otherwise willing to increase provocations in other ways, as with the test that you just mentioned of the shorter range missiles. And one has the sense that uh, the basic disagreement over how much denuclearization is required to allow for a lifting of sanctions and perhaps a peace treaty, that disagreement is not being resolved in any way at the moment. So I, I do fear that we are headed in the wrong direction. The SLBM North Korea fired on October 2nd is presumed to have a minimum range of uh, 2,100 kilometers. Uh, this could pose a threat to the mainland of the United States. Shouldn't this be concerning for President Trump? Well, I think President Trump should be concerned about all North Korean missiles because uh, leave aside that we are sworn to be allied with South Korea and Japan, we also have 200,000 Americans living in South Korea and about 75,000 Americans living in Japan. And then, as perhaps you're insinuating, Guam is within range of a 2,000-kilometer uh, missile, roughly speaking. And, uh, of course, a submarine could go out to sea and put Alaska or Hawaii at risk after a couple thousand miles of, of transit of the Western Pacific Ocean. So for a number of reasons, Americans are increasingly at risk. But we've been at risk from North Korea for a long time, uh, given our alliance with South Korea. And therefore, it doesn't require a threat to the homeland to make us feel solidarity and to make us uh, understand, I hope, that uh, South Korea's and Japan's security are essentially in many ways equivalent to our own. So I'm not sure if President Trump has that same view, but most American strategists over the years do subscribe to the view that we are so committed to South Korea and Japan that uh, any threat to their security is directly a threat to our own, even without bringing American territory into the conversation. Interesting. Some in South Korea speculate that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is expecting another summit with the U.S. President Donald Trump in December. Others argue Kim has given up on a December summit. Which opinion do you side with? I don't really think the timing's that important, so I don't have an opinion. I, I could easily see the idea going either way. But I do tend to believe that Kim Jong-un wants another summit with President Trump. And he would see that as the only real way to get diplomacy working again. I'm not sure, however, what President Trump himself will say, because at some point, you know, summits just for the sake of photo ops and handshakes uh, don't mean very much. And the Hanoi summit was less interesting in many ways than the Singapore summit. The uh, DMZ encounter was not really even a summit, but it was intriguing because of the visuals and the atmospherics. But nothing really happened of any consequence. And uh, we therefore have not really seen any progress substantively in the entire 2019 calendar year. And so my own view is that the United States needs to focus more on thinking about what kind of a deal we could do with North Korea. And perhaps uh, President Trump needs to send an envoy to see Kim Jong-un secretly, um, consulting only with President Moon along the way, and otherwise not even necessarily telling the public and see if some kind of a basic deal can be agreed to, and then have a summit after that. More like Kissinger and Nixon going to China in the 70s, as opposed to these summits that have a lot of, again, one-time uh, sort of surprise value, but really don't achieve very much. At some point, those kind of summits get less and less interesting. So I think a December summit, if it's, if it's uh, you know, done without any proper preparation, it's probably not a good idea. It would be better to wait a couple more months and have more of a deal ready. All right, Michael O'Hanlon, Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution. Thank you so much for sharing your insight and analysis. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Natergawa, mm -hmm. uh, what's your take on uh, Mr. O'Hanlon's uh, analysis? It seems like he's mm -hmm. more about substance as yes. opposed to well, process. Yes, I, I agree completely with him in the sense that beyond the atmospherics, beyond the optics, 
eventually and uh, we will need to have uh, flesh we need mm -hmm. to have details and concrete outcomes and i think the time having had the three su the summits that we've had now uh, we we need to have not only officials at the official levels working closely to to find to flesh out agreement but the, his idea of having a more low key mm -hmm. type of so probably informal communication is is one i think that well taken one i think there is probably room for more quieter diplomacy mm -hmm. when when having now had the high high end i mean high level uh, groundbreaking mm -hmm. dynamic changing potentially events taking place now it's time for for the uh, the nuts and bolts of the efforts to 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 be allowed to take place away from the glare of public uh, public uh, attention so to speak mm -hmm. but the, the the one that i have a little bit of uh, a footnote on is the this notion of window, window. see yeah, i mean i mean we don't want to create a self generated self imposed timeline uh, because this is a conflict that is decades long right um, it is it won't be over it can cannot be solved simply by the political the time the political timetable of a certain leader or leaders uh, in amen we of course we need to act as as urgently as possible but we in diplomacy in negotiation is best to allow things to ripe uh, rather than to create self-imposed uh, political timetable, especially if, if the timetable is internal, uh, internal to a one particular country, or elections right. are looming up or, right. or something. Right. But you know, if if we are to be as non-partisan as looking at the problem in a, in an honest way, then it, you have to allow these things to take a co its course. Yeah. Mm. You are a, a seasoned diplomat, uh, representing your government in the United Nations as well as um, scholars in the international security. So what's your expertise, knowledge, experience at gut feeling say to you about current state of US DPRK uh, relations on denuclearization? Would it get worse or would it get improved in the near future? Well, I have a feeling uh, after the, the, the couple of years of such a dynamic, potentially dynamic changing developments, we will be very much now in a holding station. Holding station. Yes, I think. I think even then, uh, it, it that will not be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You know, at least. I mean, remember prior to all the various initiatives that had taken place, the relationship, the situation was in a very bad way. I mean, you have had a number of a series of uh, missile tests and potential mm -hmm. for open conflict, but. Um, we need to consolidate, making sure that the little gain that has been made is 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 locked in. Mm. But uh, how do we avoid miscalculation? How do we avoid miscommunication? This is where I think uh, eventually, eventually, besides the bilateral U.S. DPRK trilateral, including the ROK, the inter-Korean processes, eventually there has to be some kind of a regional process. Mm -hmm. However informal, because you have to bring in the China, the Russia, the Japan, and others uh, around in the, under the same tent. Because otherwise, there, there could be spoilers out there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying these countries are spoilers, but everyone must feel invested in the process. Mm -hmm. No one must feel that they are left behind, mm -hmm. as if some deal is being worked out by someone else how about my issue? How about mm. issue A, B, C, D? Mm -hmm. And so having a regional home, uh, a process, extremely informal is very precious so mm. that people can have confidence that what we, whatever that you are working on, uh, your interests are factored in or mm -hmm. mainstream into the discussion. Yeah. Okay. What do you think of the role of economic sanctions? Do you believe that uh, it is useful to ease at least part of existing economic sanctions on North Korea, or do you believe that the sanctions must be in place? Well, it depends what are your expectations. I mean, if sanctions is, de is seen to be a substitute mm. for use of force, okay. you can say, oh, well, at least we are not using force. So this is a substitute uh, short of war. But if it's meant to change, or oh, that's one thing, uh, 
and maybe it's a way of channeling your exasperation. You feel frustrated by your incapacity, mm -hmm. so at least you are seen to be doing something. Mm -hmm. That has a, some kind of a uh, impact. But if it's meant to change behavior, my, the record of sanctions, I think, is a little bit uh, uh, gray. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure uh, sanctions, especially if it's applied in a very blunt way, mm -hmm. uh, can affect change. And especially a country like DPRK, is a country, uh, an entity, a country like DPRK is a country that is comfortable in its isolation. Mm -hmm. More of the same, <laughs> actually, I mean, in my view, is the prospect of greater interaction, more interaction with the wider community that can change the dynamics within the DPRK. So the, the people at large in the DPRK can see these are the alternatives. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I mean, of course, there is no one size fits all, but look at like Myanmar mm -hmm. uh, in Southeast Asia. You know, Myanmar was, has been the way it has been in the past, but we brought them, them in into the ASEAN, ASEAN fold. Right. Uh, you know, we are not meant to be like-minded. We have different systems. Some are democracy, some are less uh, uh, different systems. Mm -hmm. But by exposing themselves to the possibilities, then change begin to occur. Of course, not perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have ups and downs, but at least there is possibility of uh, impacting in, in the and, and by the way, I have traveled from uh, from Pyongyang to the border uh, when I returned home from from Pyongyang to China. The border uh, what's the border town? Well, it's a, it's a long, it's a three or four hour, four or five hours on the road, uh, mm. and you see the hardships uh, in 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 the provinces in the rural areas. These are ordinary uh, people. Sweet people. Yeah. I mean, they, have, they are not politicized. They have no. Uh, I mean, do we do do we want to have collective punishment? Uh, I don't know. I mean, this is a. a, a, a but mm. I'm not saying that uh, sanctions has no value, but we it has to be targeted. Mm -hmm. It has to be precise, mm -hmm. with clear, uh, monitorable, verifiable. Uh, uh, benchmark, mm -hmm. because otherwise it will become a, web, uh, a means to simply collectively impose on millions of people hardship, mm -hmm. which I think uh, they don't deserve. Okay. Yeah. Peace and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula has been President Moon Jae-in's top priority since taking office. To this end, he unveiled the new Southern Policy, an initiative aimed at building a community of peace prosperity, and people with ASEAN countries. Here's more on President Moon's diplomacy toward ASEAN. President Moon Jae-in first introduced his new Southern policy in November 2017 at the South Korea-Indonesia Business Forum held in Jakarta. The new Southern policy is one of the Moon administration's key foreign policies that seeks to expand Seoul's ties with ASEAN promising market with a burgeoning population. In addition to boosting ties with the bloc, the policy also aims to shore up support for Moon's Korean Peninsula peace drive from ASEAN nations, which have maintained close ties with North Korea. To follow up on his promise, President Moon visited the Philippines in 2017 and Vietnam, Indonesia, and Singapore in 2018. This year, he went on a three-nation tour to Malaysia, Brunei, and Cambodia in March, and traveled to Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos in September, becoming the first sitting South Korean president to have visited all 10 ASEAN member nations. Moon's new Southern policy is delivering on its intended results. The number of tours between South Korea and ASEAN reached 11 million in 2018, up 15% from the year before. South Korea's total volume of trade with ASEAN amounted to 160 billion US dollars during the same period. South Korea also signed a Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, or SEPA, with Indonesia. On November 4th, a massive trade deal known as the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, 
was reached, involving all 10 ASEAN member states and five trade partners, South Korea, China, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. The world's biggest trade deal is expected to contribute to free trade and increase investment in the region. With his drive for the new Southern policy, President Moon's vision of diversifying the country's trade market and building peace on the Korean Peninsula is now one step closer to becoming a reality. Minister, as I stated at the beginning of this program, uh, Indonesia is a special place for Moon Jae-in governor's uh, new Southern policy mm -hmm. because it was announced in Jakarta in 2017. What's the Indonesian's position on the new southern policy of South Korea? Well, it, it obviously complements and synergizes with our own outlook, uh, whether it be the bilateral Indonesia-Korea outlook, where the two countries are, are determined and driven to enhance our bilateral relationship, uh, or the region-to-region -region outlook that we've been discussing. So to have uh, such a motivation to enhance relationship not only being one way mm -hmm. but to be reciprocated uh, the way it has been through the no new southern policy is it is a tremendous asset for all concerned but you know i mean the key challenge now for for all parties is to be able to p to put into action and to demonstrate in concrete form what are the impact because ultimately we have to we need to see concrete outcomes and I think uh, the Indonesian government and and the current Indonesian government and the, the current Korean government is determined as I understand it to, to bring that forth there is one dimension that I'm I'm informed that the, our government is focused on the infrastructure building infrastructure. Um, the idea of development of human resources mm -hmm. uh, development those are areas where Korea has such a tremendous assets uh, that, that we, can, we can partner with together and, mm -hmm. and um, it's, uh, it's, it's tremendous opportunities for sure. Yeah. My last question to you is the uh, economic partnership mm -hmm. between South Korea and the ASEAN because South Korea and the ASEAN members are now in the same boat yes. uh, called the RCEP, Regional yes. uh, Cooperative Economic Partnership. Yes. And uh, last year's uh, trade volume mm -hmm. uh, 2000, in 2018 reached uh, 160 billion US dollars and mm -hmm. it is expected to grow. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what's your uh, advice on keeping the good things rolling? Well, uh, I mean, ASEAN and Korea have been very, very good and very capable in identifying roadmaps, Road in, map. in determining the roadmaps ahead to achieve certain verifiable targets, 160, 200 billion uh, targets. Uh, I think we must press on with those, the, the known unknown, so to speak. So we know what we want to achieve and then we work on it. But I think uh, the, the importance of an uh, event like the forthcoming summit are for, is for leaders not only to work on the existing path, but to identify new ones. I think this is where the role of the leaders becomes very precious because uh, the current efforts are already in the pipeline. You have tremendous, uh, all kinds of roadmaps a, B, C, D, and the different pillars, economic, political security, and cultural. But the leaders must sit and interact between themselves and identify what's going to be the world, the region going to be like 20, 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. How can we ready ourselves mm -hmm. to that world, not to the present situation? Right, right. I think this is where, as I've said before, uh, leadership matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and to have here in, in Korea, uh, president as President Moon, who's very much, uh, you know, uh, thinking outside the box, I think is a tremendous uh, asset for all concerned. And, mm -hmm. and I hope, uh, you know, I mean, the summit will be crowned with success, and I'm sure it will be crowned with success. And I know for a fact that all the ASEAN leaders are really looking forward uh, mm -hmm. to attending the summit. All right. Thank you. I mean, Sir Natalgawa, uh, we feel so fortunate and Thank honored you. to have you here and Thank get you. your expertise and analysis and the timing is impeccable Thank as you. we are waiting for the third uh, Korea ASEAN commemorative summit meeting Thank you. Uh, and celebrating 30th anniversary of the establishment of relations between uh, ASEAN, ASEAN and South Korea. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank you very coming much here. for having me. Thank right, you. safe trip back. Thank you very much indeed. Right. Thank you. And that's all we have for you on today's special episode of Peace and Prosperity. 
on the ASEAN Rock Commemorative Summit meeting. We'll be back next week with more Korean Peninsula issues. Thanks for watching.